Hey everybody, welcome back to my whole art show. This week uh, I am going to actually be focusing on a practice that I developed which follows along some of the ideas that I was talking about last week. Uh, last week I was pretty much making the argument for agnosticism. Um, I know that spirituality is kind of a bugaboo for some people, especially dyed-in-the-wool atheists, and I've been kind of arguing all along that, in all honesty, the, the most honest you can be is agnostic with an open mind. Um, <clears throat> and I got into some ideas that uh, Marie-Louise von Franz shared about um, postulating that the physical world, the universe, is what our unconscious is as a way of explaining synchronicity. So this week uh, I'm going to be sharing a practice that I've used um, several times in my artistic process and in other situations, which is a wonderful way to explore that and to find out for yourself if there's any truth to that. Um, and the practice is this. Um, when you are working on your creative medium, in your creative medium, and uh, some mediums are much easier to do this with than others, and I'll get into that after I give you the exercise or the practice. Um, but it can have some pretty immediate interesting effects on your mind as you work and uh, opening your perceptions. And I always find that good as an inspiration for any creative endeavor I'm involved in. But the practice is pretty simple. As you work on something, keep naming it yourself. Name it you. So if you're working on a sculpture, as you work on it, think to yourself, this is me. I'm working on myself. This is my body. If it gets confusing, look at your hand and say, this is my body. This is me. Because it is. And then just switch back to the material you're working with and say, this is me. This is my body. Now, um, it's ironic because I'm a filmmaker and a musician, and I have tried over and over again to use this practice <clears throat> when I'm making films or making music, and it is so, so difficult, especially with filmmaking. There's so much I have to be keeping in mind as I work. Composition, performance, um, light, exposure, um, general cinematography issues, focus. Uh, are, am I on my mark? Are people on their marks? Um, and even in animation, I'm pretty absorbed in uh, making sure that the puppet is, or even the drawing or whatever, is done correctly and, and, and the movement is of the right increment and all that stuff. So it's pretty much impossible for me to do that while filmmaking. And also in music, I'm so involved in a wordless kind of rhythm and feel that this just doesn't work. So, pretty ironic. Um, however, it's good that the film I'm working on is animated because um, I'm having to do sculptures and I'm having to do paintings. And this is much easier to do with fine arts. So, um, you know, my film White Lick, I had to make the Satan puppet. And I used this technique pretty much while I was making the puppet. It's much easier to do when, it, when you're not constantly calibrating what you're doing. So sculpture, painting, um, drawing, those are perfect for it. Um, I've never done it with dance, I can't say. Um, and I imagine it probably even works with photography because um, you're not usually under the time crunches that you are with filmmaking um, or video making that you um, 
um, with photography, you're not under those kind of time crunches. So I don't want to say a lot about what to expect from the exercise because I want people to find out for themselves. For me, it was complete revelation and amazing. Um, I will say that the theory behind it is that You know, there's been studies that are done on how the brain works with cognitive and perceptual functions. And we're generally getting so much information all the time that it would overwhelm consciousness to be able to take in all that information. And so one way our mind works is that it uses our beliefs. This has been verified in, in research studies. Our beliefs are used to limit the amount of perceptual data that comes to us. If you don't believe something is important, if you don't believe something is possible, you literally don't perceive it. And that's the way of blocking out extraneous information, perceptual information, or cognitive information in the brain so that you can focus on what you think is important. And that, of course, includes what you think is possible. Um, and this, this is a, a great evolutionary boon for us. Otherwise, we would be overwhelmed with perceptual and sensory data. However, the problem is our beliefs are not usually in alignment with truth. Our beliefs are totally conditioned by our culture, what our parents believed, what our parents valued, what our family valued, what religions we've been involved in and what they value, and what any kind of worldview or scientific opinion in the culture that we've grown up in has promulgated. Uh, so, and as anybody who's got two eyes can see, what people believe very often is not at all tangentially even related to what is actually true. So this acts as a way of cleansing our beliefs on a very temporary basis, although it can actually be used on a long-term basis. Um, I won't get into that now, but, you know, for instance, we might not notice, we might just say, oh, plant, and see this plant, and then not perceive any more details. Or we might say, oh, this is green, and just leave it at that. But what that, what that means is that you're having a label put on it, and then you're no longer open to all the different sensory and perceptual data that's available there. Again, that's an evolutionary step that kept us from being overwhelmed. But that tends to not only give us problems when the beliefs are not in alignment with truth, but they keep us from actually experiencing the richness and beauty and profundity and mystery in life. So by labeling whatever we're working on, you know, a sculpture, a drawing, a painting, or that which we are drawing or painting or sculpting, looking at the actual object as you draw it, by labeling everything me, this is me, this is all me, it short, short circuits all of those beliefs and ideas and labels. And you actually become open to what's there. You actually see what's there. As a fine artist, you can't ask for something better. It's a way to actually perceive more clearly. And I think you may find that it, you actually perceive a greater depth and beauty than what you normally would with our normal perceptual and belief-oriented filters on. So uh, I encourage you to try this and see what it's like for you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I found it to be pretty amazing. Um, secondly, I just want to end on going over something that I had put in a previous blog post that I only devoted a, a paragraph to, and I realized that it was a pretty great statement, and I want to expound on it a little bit more. Um, in, in this kind of uh, postmodern culture, beauty is kind of seen as, 
And this relates to the exercise I just gave. Beauty is kind of seen as a very culturally conditioned thing. And in a lot of cases it is. Um, what's beautiful for somebody in, in uh, West Africa is probably very different from somebody in um, New England, United States, or for that matter, um, somebody in Southeast Asia, an indigenous person in, you know, uh, say an uh, indigenous Australian Aborigine. Those are all cult culture, culturally conditioned. But I think we throw the baby out with the bathwater when we make that into a dogma because we're all of this earth. We're all creatures of this earth and we all have a long history of evolving in the ecosystem of this earth. And the beauty and the majesty of this earth have greatly informed all of our ancestors and by default to a certain degree, even us in this generation of what beauty is. The beauty of a nurturing, holding environment, a world that gives us clean water and good food and darkness so we can sleep, and a morning to wake up to, and the sound of the tides coming in and out, and the sound of the wind, and animal cries, and bird song. These are the foundations of our concepts of beauty. And they're not to be ignored, and they're not to be little, belittled. And they're universal. They're beyond the cultural conditioning, because who hasn't been on the earth? We have yet to have any colonies on any other planet, so we're all seeped in the natural rhythms and um, functions of this beautiful planet. So um, that beauty is of our larger body. The Earth, in many ways, is our larger body. Trees are part of our lungs. The waters are a form of our own bodily system, the rivers, the oceans. You can't breathe unless the plants are going through their process of exchanging oxygen for carbon dioxide. You know, all you need to do is sufficiently pollute the waters and you'll soon realize that um, you've polluted your own body. All you need to do is cut down enough trees and you'll soon realize that you've stuck a knife in your own lungs. So in that sense, this practice of working with everything and saying, this is me, is functionally true. It's not just some crazy idea. It's functionally, authentically true. So if some of you are having trouble with the, this idea of if you're drawing something and saying, oh, that's me, that doesn't make sense, that's not me, think again. Especially if you're looking at something or drawing something or recording, audio recording something that's um, in the natural world. It is you in many ways. And by thinking that while you do it, not only are you getting in touch with the truth, but your sides, you're, you're cutting off your normal labels and belief so that you can actually perceive what's there. So I'll be really curious to see what, uh, if anybody does this and please, if you do, please put in the comments below what you found, what you discovered. I'd love to hear about it. Um, yeah, I'd be really excited to see that. So that's it for this week. Um, I'll be back with more stuff in the future. And I hope this was helpful. And have a great week. All right, bye.